Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar today. I'm Francis Seeley from Global Net 21 and Improved Voices and this is one of the many webinars that we do that look at some of the big issues that face us. And today we're going to look at how we can make a difference to the probably the biggest problem that we're going to face ever and that's climate change. Now some people who address climate change do it individually by changes in lifestyles and diet and so on. Other people believe you need collective action you need to put pressure on governments and corporations to reduce fossil fuels. But there are other people who believe that individuals, if they work together collaboratively, can make a huge difference in reducing emissions and reducing our carbon footprint. And today we have two people who have a project that's doing just that. And we have Said Hassan and Lucy White, who's from the Complexity University, and they'll explain to you what that is in a minute. And they're going to talk to us about the project they have, which does bring people together to make a difference. So, Said and, and Lucy, welcome to the webinar. And I'm really, really pleased that you, you're taking part in, in this today. And yeah, can I begin by asking you, Said, if, if you could tell us a little about yourself and why you're so concerned about the issue of climate change? Yeah, thanks for having us um, here, Francis. So, my, um, so I'm based in Oxford in the UK. Uh, my background is that um, I've been working on challenges that you could consider complex for the last uh, 20 years. And um, challenges that are complex are usually challenges where everyone agrees there's a challenge and there's um, vast disagreement about how to actually tackle the challenge and what to do. Um, so I've worked all over the world, um, you know, in the UK and Europe, in Asia, North America, and um, I started working in the climate space about 15 years ago. And um, I guess, you know, my interest in climate was um, professional originally that I started working in the space. And what basically emerged, um, you know, from me essentially just trying to be helpful to people in the climate change space um, grew, I guess, into a concern that we don't really have a strategy uh, for tackling the climate crisis. Um, and, you know, that's grounded in the fact that over the last 30 years, sort of emissions have gone up and increased um, dramatically, and they aren't declining as per the science is saying they need to. And the consequences of that are obviously quite serious. So that's where sort of my interest uh, in climate comes. Um, so it, it brings together, obviously, a professional interest um, and my professional concerns with obviously deeply personal concerns in the terms of the trajectory of society and the planet. So that's kind of yeah. my background. Okay, and um, Lucy, um, tell me about yourself as well and why you think climate change is such an important issue. Oh, thank you, Francis. Um, so I'm based in Stroud in the UK, um, and I'm a, a writer and a coach and a facilitator as my background. Um, I also do some sort of therapeutic work with individuals. Um, and, you know, I, I love the magic that happens when you bring people together under the right conditions and they discover what's possible in themselves and in the group and what they're able to achieve. Um, I, yeah, I really follow the power of that in, in all my different lines of work. Um, and so it's been great to, to be involved in bringing people together both on like a local level, but then also joining them up into a global network of people who can um, really uh, tackle such a huge, huge target um, by breaking it down and working together. So, um, yeah, that's what drew me to, to the project and, and I, I think that the reason climate change is important is um, one of survival for all of us. Um, we live on a beautiful planet and we all want to continue that forever. So. Okay, so say you argue, don't you, that we need to reduce carbon by something like a billion uh, tonnes of CO2 per year. What happens if we don't do that? So, um, I mean, the, the, the numbers that I'm, I'm citing are, um, you know, come from the science and the assessments that are made by scientists in terms of what needs to happen. Um, my understanding of what happens if we don't reduce emissions by that amount, um, and actually it's a little bit more now, um, is that we essentially kind of breach planetary limits in terms of um, what is healthy, if you like. Um, but specifically, the consequences of that are that we, you know, we will see temperature rises um, beyond sort of two degrees. And currently, the current kind of pledges that we have uh, around the Paris Agreement probably put us, you know, over three degrees. And um, worst case scenario has put us at six degrees. And if we get kind of beyond three degrees in that range of three to six, then we'll see things like, you know, the collapse of agriculture, the collapse of 
things like the Amazon rainforest and so on. So in short, the ecosystems that we depend on to survive as human beings are under threat and um, risk collapse. Okay, so nevertheless, a billion tons is a lot. I mean, I guess that's to reduce the carbon dioxide as parts in a million to about what James Hansen thinks is necessary, which is 350 parts to a million. At the moment, it's about 411. Now, to do that is, is huge. I mean, Zoe, uh, I'm going to call you Zoe again, but Lucy, um, do you think this is, is really possible? Can we do it, or have we gone past the point of no return? Well, um, we can give it a good try is, is where we're coming from. Um, there's time to make the numbers add up um, if we work at scale. So a gigaton is a huge amount. It's, um, you know, the whole emissions of Africa or Germany in a year. Um, but if you have a thousand teams working on that challenge, then each team has a, a megaton a year to reduce, which is, I think it's 3,000 cars off the road, uh, which, although still a large number, is somehow a bit more manageable. Um, and if you know, if you go down to the individual level of, a, you know, even starting with a ton of carbon, which is what we're doing for our warm up, which is really a tiny amount of the broad proportion. Um, but an individual can go to 10 people in their street and coach 10 households to reduce their food waste by 100 grams a day over 20 days. And that's a ton of carbon. So, you know, if, if we have, you know, thousands or millions of individuals around the world, even doing this simple action, um, the numbers do add up. So, um, yes, it's possible. And yes, it's huge. <laughs> I mean, what you've just described, I think, is um, what some people would refer to, or what you refer to, is the is a gigaton uh, project, isn't it? Um, I mean, do you want to tell us a bit more about that, uh, say, about the gigaton project, how you started it, and how you get people together, and what it actually does? Yeah, sure. Um, and just one tiny little um, technical detail. So it's a billion tons of greenhouse gas emissions, not CO2, so it's CO2e. Um, so it includes other types of emissions as well, including methane and so on. So just a, just a tiny detail. Um, yeah, so the, the, <clears throat> um, the, the effort that we're undertaking is called the Gigaton Challenge. And, um, and basically the goal is to, is to demonstrate in practice how we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions by a billion tons a year, which as you rightfully point out is an enormous uh, amount. Um, the origins of um, the work go back to 2009 with the collapse of the Copenhagen talk. So I was doing a bunch of work um, in the climate space then and um, post Copenhagen, I did a little bit of work on, you know, given the talks have collapsed and we don't have a legally binding treaty now, uh, what would a strategy look like for reducing emissions? And really um, Gigaton came out of that. And the idea was that, you know, can we imagine, imagine or articulate, if you like, a strategy where the numbers add up uh, that is practical to do and that's actually possible to do in terms of implementing it. Um, so that's that's sort of the origins. The origins come from sort of the collapse of the talks in, in Copenhagen almost a decade ago. And we've been working over a decade to refine, if you like, this idea or this um, approach um, and are kicking it off this year in October. But what, I mean, what is, what is the, the approach itself? I mean, what do you do to make yeah. it happen? Yeah, so, so the, I mean, the crux of it is um, uh, what Lucy was kind of um, alluding to is that, you know, there's this massive target, which is, you know, a billion tons a year, um, and emissions need to kind of peak and then decline by a billion tons a year. If, if we had one team trying to take, undertake that challenge, their target would be a billion tons. But if we split that um, target into a thousand teams, the target drops to, you know, one megaton a team. But obviously, if you have 2,000 teams, the target drops even more. So the kind of key insight with Gigaton is that the more teams that we have working on the challenge, the higher the probability that we will achieve the target, because each of these teams individually is going to undertake something that is manageable. So really, um, the approach is how do we get um, multiple teams across the world working towards a shared common target? And really, kind of the, the innovation um, at the heart of this is essentially the idea of multiple teams or the team. Um, multiple teams working locally in their own context, um, trying to tackle a shared global target. Okay, so it's about getting teams together to work together to reduce collaboratively their, their carbon footprint. Okay, um, Lucy, I mean, how do you do that? How do you get teams together? Where do they come from? And how do they get coherent so they can do this in a way that you think they need to? Mm -hmm. 
So we're, we're having city focused teams. Uh, we've already got seven, over 70 cities globally who've put forward some participants in their team. Um, and we are working with them to gather sort of the, the remaining numbers. We're looking at, in the beginning, about 15 people per team, and that will go up as the targets become higher and, and more challenging and the resources available become more to support them. Um, but in the beginning, we have these, uh, a team in each city and we have um, these processes um, of, of bringing a team of multiple um, diverse stakeholders together that have been practiced and refined over the last 20 years of um, Syed's work um, with his, his um, co-founders. Um, and we have coaches, so we'll have a couple of coaches per team to support them through um, perhaps how to approach the challenge, but what they do comes from the team themselves. So that will depend on their context, their skills, the resources they have access to within their city. Um, and we'll coach them through a process for getting straight into um, an active learning um, prototyping um, process where they can come up with an intervention and then um, quickly, you know, sort of we say fail fast and then refine and revise that prototype um, to become more effective. And the idea is that by repeating this process multiple times, the teams will become more and more effective and develop uh, interventions that have more and more impact in their city. Um, and they will be obviously varied across the world. Okay, you, you talk about um, impact and um, that, that's a crucial question really, isn't it? And that is, um, how do you have that impact and how do you measure it? I mean, lots of projects are, you know, pie in the sky sometimes. They say we, we can reduce by this and that, but you never know whether they've actually done it. People feel good that they're doing it, but we don't know whether the emissions have been reduced. So if you get teams together and you want them to reduce by a ton a year, how do you measure, Zaid, that they've actually done that? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so that's a really good question. And um, I, think, I think just to be clear that <clears throat> the target of kind of one ton is just a little warm-up exercise. So the, the, the real targets will be in the, in the hundreds of thousands of tons um, you know, per year. And so um, the, the idea is that you know, when, when these teams are doing relatively small amounts, like a ton, which is really kind of inconsequential, um, there isn't there isn't a rigorous kind of baseline, but what we're going to ask teams to do is just do a back of the envelope calculation, give us an estimate, um, and and once teams start doing very significant numbers, then they're going to be required to essentially provide more of an audit. There'll be more of a compliance issue, so we're going to give them a framework for reporting, which will be auditable, um, but that will come down the line when teams are sort of doing hundreds of thousands of tons of CO two, and I think the 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 key thing here is that. If you've got multiple teams across the world using a shared audit process, then you can compare performance. Then you can say, okay, you know, how is the team in Bristol done versus a team in, in India? Um, but at the moment, what we've kind of got globally is we've got multiple standards, everyone using different kind of measurement uh, options and different approaches. And there's no way of kind of comparing, um, there's no way of comparing performance. So the idea here is that we're able to compare from performance. There'll be some audit, there'll be um, a standard put in place for measurement. Um, I think one important thing just to say about measurement is that, you know, the problem with really rigorous measurement um, metrics is that that becomes the end in itself. So people start worrying about, you know, the metrics rather than the actual practicality of doing something. So just to stress, the idea here is to take real action and to, to really do something rather than to play kind of a metrics game and to basically worry about the paperwork, basically, which is important, absolutely important. But the devil's in the detail, isn't it? And and that is, that is whether you are reducing the carbon emissions. So the metrics yeah. do become crucial to your success. So if you have an auditing system, what is the detail of that auditing system that you can with confidence say you have made a difference in reducing emissions? See, the thing is, I, I, I sort of agree with you and I also disagree with you. So... <clears throat> <clears throat> where you have very rigorous auditing um, and accounting process in place, you also get a phenomenon called gaming where people essentially kind of make up data um, <clears throat> and essentially are kind of lying about the data. So I think, I think you definitely need um, an auditing system that can capture data. But what you also need is you need people who have the right incentives to do the work and are committed to doing the work that are not doing the work because they've been forced to do the work or because they're under threat to do the work, which is where these auditing systems kind of really fall apart. Um, what I would also say is that, you know, we've got very rigorous um, accounting and auditing practices across the world, 
Um, but they don't prevent things like, you know, um, Enron happening or the collapse of, you know, many kind of companies where you've got these auditing processes in place. So I would just caution, um, caution to, in terms of seeing kind of measurement as being the end all. The other reason I would kind of say that is that, you know, the notion that CO2 is the problem is really kind of um, not the full picture. So carbon dioxide is a, is a symptom of a much deeper problem. And the deeper problem is obviously our relationship to the natural world and how we live our lives. So, you know, if we live very high consumption, high energy lifestyles, then it's obvious that something isn't, isn't working. And we measure that in terms of CO2 emissions. So emissions becomes kind of a proxy for a very, uh, for a deeper issue, which is, you know, what is our relationship to the natural world and how are we kind of living? So I would just say that you can't reduce that to a metric. Well, you know, we're going to be doing a webinar this Thursday on permaculture, which is about how you relate to the, the living world. Um, and, and that's great. But if it doesn't reduce carbon emissions um, and doesn't do so demonstrably, we yeah. still have a problem, Lucy. I, I mean, how do we, you know, some people say maybe we shouldn't be just dealing with lifestyle changes and and and. and concentrating how people can commune with nature. We should be campaigning against governments and corporations to stop using fossil fuels. Don't you think that's a priority more than anything else? Um, I think we need people working at all the different levels. Um, and the thing is that it takes, we've seen how the speed of um, change at, you know, high corporate levels and government levels and, you know, the us. So there are things that we can begin to do now as individuals um, and we can also um, influence organizations and governments within our cities and within our reach as a group of individuals who are taking action. Um, so beginning with the one chan, you know, yes, this is going to be more um, work in, in, you know, in the community. But at the same time, we had um, over the summer, we ran a, a four week summer school of this and we had the local government team from um, Halifax, Nova Scotia, who were executing their climate change strategy. Um, and they started their work on this strategy to deliver it by joining um, our competitive university summer school. Um, and so they were coming up, you know, they had access to things like they were putting forward electric cars to replace delivery vehicles and things in their community. So they were able to work with organizations as well. And what's important in this process is to have diverse stakeholders, so to have all of these people around the table working together on this issue, uh, rather than sort of grassroots over here, governments and organisations over here. You know, it's really a joined up approach um, and we need people who have connection and reach in all of those areas. Um, so that's how I see it. And so I'd like to add to that. Okay. Yeah, I, I would just add one thing, which is that, you know, uh, if we don't have governments, businesses and organisations involved, ultimately, it's not gonna work. Um, so it can't just be individual lifestyle changes. It can't just be community-based efforts. It has to involve businesses. It has to involve government. Um, and if those people are participating in the teams, and that's been our work over the last 20 years, how do we build teams, as Lucy's kind of saying, that are multi-sectoral, that involve civil society, community-based organizations, governments, and businesses working together. Is that why you created the Complexity University, which maybe you could talk about, is a way of giving some background or a background knowledge base to what people are doing. So they're not sort of working in the dark. They have a plan, they have a focus and they have an output. Is that the, the sort of mission of the university, say? Yeah, so I think, I think you know, we, we obviously hear the word complexity used more and more and more to describe the situations and systems that we're in. And really, you know, our goal with Complexity University in some ways is really simple. If you want to learn how to work effectively in the context of complexity today, where do you go? So our goal is, you know, can, you, can we create um, a, a context and environment where you can join a community where you can learn what it means to be effective at tackling challenges that are complex in nature, um, and you can actually practice building, if you like, you know, the language you, we use is that it's all about practice, that you're only going to get good at something if you, if you practice. So really the point of Complexity University is, you know, how do we build the muscles to tackle and to be effective at tackling challenges that are complex? And arguably, you know, at the moment, um, there are very few places that focus on that as their, as their mission, as their goal. Um, Obviously, you can go and learn lots of techniques and lots of approaches and lots of different places. But the idea is how do we bring them together um, with a really clear kind of focus on tackling complex challenges? But if, if someone wanted to get together and do the sort of things you're talking about as a local group, 
they don't necessarily have to sign up to the university, do they? They don't have to necessarily take courses, or do they have to in your system, uh, Lucy? Um, obviously, there's lots of people organising in many different ways on the local level who are, you know, um, being effective and, and doing things in their way. We're offering, um, you know, 20 years of experience tackling complex challenges and working with groups to support them to tackle those challenges. So over that time, we have, um, as you say, a knowledge base and some practices um, that we can share. And, and the courses are an action learning experience. So people can come for two weeks and be part of um, the Gigaton Challenge and learn some skills and some um, practices and have some experiences um, that they can then take back to their own communities or organisations and implement there. Um, otherwise, they can bring their organisations or their, their teams into this process and use it as a guiding framework and a support system for the work that they're doing and also contribute to the overall Gigaton strategy by continuing to go through these cycles with us. Um, so. That's, yeah, that's what I so, said. So, I mean, Lucy talks about a, a two week course or a two week time. Um, is, is that what you do, two weeks? Or, and when people are, you know, involved with the university, what is it that you teach? What is it that they learn? Hmm. I mean, just to go back to your kind of earlier question, obviously, no one has to do anything. I mean, it's entirely voluntary for people to, to want to sign up to what we're doing. So, in terms of what we actually do, so you know, we run courses that last for a couple of days. We run courses that last for a month, um, you know, two weeks. Um, with Gigaton, the way we're operating is that we've got a number of what we call two-week sprints. So in October, November, December. So the idea is you sign up for a two-week period. And the idea is that you're practicing in that two-week period how to reduce um, emissions as part of a team. Um, what people learn um, at, at Complexity University is much broader, obviously, than just Gigaton. So what they're learning is, you know, everything from you know, what is effective strategy, what is effective practice, but also what is malpractice? So what does it look like to actually um, be doing things that don't work in the context of complexity? Um, you know, what are the nature of challenges that are complex? How are they different from technical challenges? What capabilities do you need in order to tackle complex challenges? And really, you know, the approach we take is, um, so we talk about active learning versus passive learning. And the idea is that people aren't sitting there watching videos um, you know, pre-recorded videos of a lecture, but really they're participating actively and they're doing things together. And our role as faculty with Complex University is, you know, how do we support people to learn by doing, which is a very different mode to kind of classroom learning where you're just sitting and, and kind of getting some information, if you like. Um, the idea, particularly kind of on our intermediate and advanced courses is that um, you're gonna have to do something and we will support you as coaches, as faculty to do those things. Um, and reducing emissions by one ton is, is an example. So it's not about writing a paper, it's not about writing a proposal for how to do it or Googling it. It's about actually doing it in practice um, and taking an honest crack at it and seeing you know, what you learn from doing it. So, I mean, is, is, is what you do, uh, Lucy, is it a business or is it a community project? Do people have to pay to do this or given the fact we're trying to save the planet, it, do you also take people who, who can't pay and want to do it, but can't provide the income? Mm -hmm. So we've, um, yeah, I think we've given, I think the numbers are something like 12,000 um, full scholarships over the last um, year of, of learning. Um, we offer this uh, a, band, a banded sort of um, fee bracket starting from zero. And we have lower rates for people in like individuals and students and people can apply obviously for the birth rate scholarship places um, and we have higher rates for people who are coming in um, sponsored by their organizations to train and to learn so financial but the idea is that um, there's no financial barriers to this learning and this experience um, and we offer it in that spirit but it's also um, in the spirit of gift culture, which is where people give what they can and involve a little stretch so that others can also participate. So it's a shared economy model, really. Okay. Uh, sorry, it's, 12, it's, it's about 1,200, um, oh. not 12,000. <laughs> we launched Complexity <laughs> University in, in, April, in April, and we've had about 2,500 people sign up. And about half of those, I would say, are on full scholarships where they're not paying anything. 
I mean, one of the other things you also talk about, um, Zaid, is, is the, um, the equity target, the fact that some people in the world are affected disproportionately by climate change and other people. You talk about it. How do you feed that in into what you do? Uh, yeah, so I think in, in particular sort of around Gigaton, one of the you know, one of the big issues in the climate space is this equity issue that, you know, if uh, the bulk of global emissions have occurred in the West, um, then who should pay for those um, emissions? And also, do we constrain and restrict people in the global South from, you know, from development, from sort of, you know, from, from lifestyles, if you like, that we have here in the West? Um, the challenge, obviously, is that if everyone aspires to a very high energy lifestyle, then it doesn't really work. Um, um, I, I think the issue is that you can't legally kind of constrain people from doing that. People have to voluntarily want to aspire to a lifestyle, if you like, that is commensurate with living on the planet. Um, and the problem in some ways is, is the West has kind of set up a, a model that others are trying to emulate. Um, so how we deal with this in practice is that, you know, with, with any strategy, there's always a question of who benefits from the strategy. So if you think about the gigaton, the question is who benefits. And if, if the people who benefit primarily from gigaton turn out to be financiers or bankers, then it's not really going to work. So the way we work with it practically is that the, the question of who benefits is really forefront in terms of, you know, any activity that we undertake. Um, and with gigaton, particularly if people who are most vulnerable, the people who are kind of suffering, people who are, um, if you like, at the sharp end of the, the climate sphere, if they don't um, spear, if they don't benefit from this, it's not really going to work. Um, and the equity piece is, again, that, you know, the more teams you have, um, the more likely you are to tackle that equity issue in that what we need is, um, you know, what, what we need is lots and lots of people to be impacted positively. But the other flip side of that, I just want to say is that, you know, the climate crisis will not get resolved by the elite investing in and finding the resources to pay for the climate crisis frankly, because they don't have the resources to do that. There isn't enough money in the world to do that. So unless there is widespread kind of investment from people on the ground, people that, you know, might not have money, but have skills, talent, time, resources in other ways, unless those people are actually co-investing with us, we're not going to solve the problem. So the equity issue really um, has two sides to it, which is the people benefiting, but also we need people to invest what they have. And actually, you know, I, I shy away from that kind of the deficit mindset of kind of going, people don't have anything, therefore they can't contribute anything. Actually, people have a lot. And we're just used to kind of seeing things through this kind of very narrow kind of financial lens. But actually, if you look wider, um, there's a huge amount that people can contribute, are able to contribute. And if they're going to do so, then they should benefit from it. And that's practically what we're trying to do with these teams. Okay, so you're trying to create a bottom-up momentum to, to get this uh, um, to cascade. Um, Lucy, I mean, how would you measure your success metrics again? Well, it's not metrics really, it's, it's sort of a, an insightful thing on your part. I mean, how will you know if you succeeded? How many groups would you need to get going to be able to say that the momentum has really started? Um, I mean, that's an important question because you may end up doing a very small thing or you may end up doing an explosive thing that makes a real difference. How will you know when you cross that line? Well, there's going to be levels of success. So if you look at this, the Gigaton strategy, it's, it's, you know, it's analogous with sort of climbing Mount Everest. Like, you know, we're definitely walking in the foothills right now. You know, base camp is here and et cetera. So, you know, obviously if we get to, um, you know, 4,000 plus teams globally um, who are approaching a gigaton of emissions a year, that's great. We've cracked it. And, you know, that's up and rolling. But in the, in the short to medium term, um, we're aiming for 100 city teams by Christmas. Um, we have 77 um, city cities with participants signed up. Um, it would be amazing if we can can get that number off the ground and going through the process because then the momentum and the, you know, the the sort of um, the experience that we'll have then under our belts across the whole globe will be um, a fantastic launch pad for going for bigger targets and more teams um, and for getting the word out with other people. Um, you know, by the middle of next year or, well, <laughs> it's an ambitious time frame, but um, it would be great to have, you know, say 400 teams working on, you know, 10, 10 or 100 tons each um, and to be able to start getting funding and resources in so we can create jobs so people could be working on this full time, really put their energy and their skills into it 
and start reaching for those bigger targets. So there are levels of success and we need to complete one before we can move forward with the strategy to the next. Um, Zaid might have anything to add to that, but that's what I see. Okay, well, well let, let me ask you then, how, how do people get involved? I mean, I presume this is not just a UK project, it's a global project, and maybe you could let us know that. But I mean, what sort of people get involved? I mean, have you got them from very deprived areas that would suffer badly from climate change? So they come from the richer, um, more um, sort of university educated areas? I mean, what are the sort of people that who, who get involved, where do they come from, and how can other people get involved, say? Um, yeah, so, so the, the participants involved are very diverse. So we have, you know, everyone from 16-year-old students in India to professors in North America. Um, so there's a range of diversity. It is global, as you said. So we're looking at um, um, I, primarily kind of cities across the world at the moment. Um, and the way to get involved is really simple. You can go to our website, you can go to gigaton.co um, or complexity.university, and you can basically sign up to join a team. Um, you can also sign up to actually convene a team and bring a team, get a team together. So Francis, for example, we know that you know, you're involved in a lot of groups on the ground um, in Enfield and other places. So you could convene a, a team in, in Enfield or wherever you're based and actually just sign up. Um, and really the commitment at this point is, is just a two weeks. So you could sign up for two weeks in October or you could sign up for all three of the two weeks. But the idea here is that it's a fairly low bar to get involved at this stage. And you know, as Lucy said, the idea is to practice together. We're not climbing Mount Everest in a day. Um, we're gonna climb some fairly gentle hills if you like, or you know, before we start um, trying to tackle these very kind of steep and very daunting kind of mountains. But um, the bar is fairly low to get involved at the moment. And really, you know, um, the, the thing about who get in, gets involved is the important thing is your commitment to the issue and your energy to try and do something about it and and having if you like the courage to try something that's different much more than kind of your technical skill sets at this point okay and well, lucy, know, lucy has an example i don't know if you want to mention that lucy that might be helpful okay lucy um so we have a team um from a town in india who wrote to us um via translation and these guys, um, it touched all of us, you know, they're, they're I think, engineers and um, industrial workers who have been um, out of work since COVID and have been um, wanting to come together and try and do something proactive and meaningful. And, you know, they've, they've put, I think it's 15 or 20 of them have come together and said, we would like to sign up as a team, you know, we're not doing this in our first language. We know that we might fail at the first, in the first attempt. So we're gonna sign up for two sprints. Um, and we've pulled together what resources we have to make an equal contribution to like, level the playing field for learning. And we want to offer some payment, you know, even having been out of work. And, and it's absolutely phenomenal. The, what really makes them stand out is the commitment and the courage to be like, we're going to have a go at this. We want to try and come together and make a difference and do something meaningful together. Um, and the power of that has been huge and, um, yeah, and just beautiful to see. So we've welcomed them aboard. Um, okay. Just, well, okay, well... We've sort of come to the end of our half hour now. It's gone very, very quickly, as it always does. Does So, you know, thank you for doing that. And it sounds like an incredibly um, imaginative uh, project, which must take a lot of organization. And you, you've gone a long way so far. So let's hope some people by watching this will be interested in it. And we'll make sure it's spread on the social network sites so that people can see it and get in touch with you if they are interested. So thank you both for joining us today and for doing this interview. And, uh, you know, we look forward to see how the project develops and we'll uh, end this interview now.